everybody said I welcome everyone tonight to our Bible study in Jesus name and the Lord make the study enrich your life lift you up give you understanding and understanding will increase your faith in Jesus name I love that amen another amen Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for the faithfulness of your people. Thank you, Lord, because you've gathered us together so that your word can be a blessing to everyone. We pray, Lord, everyone here without individual, our lives will account for you in Jesus' name. Lord, everything that makes life useless, everything that returns our lives, and we're not able to fulfill the purpose for which you made us, take it away from every life in Jesus' name. We will be profitable. We will be useful. And our life will count for our families, will count for the church, will count for the kingdom of God. Every life will count for eternity. We will not regret that we came to this life. Every life will count in Jesus' name. Confirm it in every life. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to Mark chapter 11. And tonight we're looking at verses 12 to 14. Then we pick it up again from verse 20. You see the reason why. We're looking at Mark chapter 11, and we're reading from verse 12. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing the fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if aptly, perhaps, he might find some fruit, anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Come to verse 20. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, says unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. And Jesus answering says unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou remote, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. Therefore, I say unto you, that what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Verse 25, and when ye stand praying, forgive, if ye have ought against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Those are the verses we're looking at today. As you come to verse 12, it says on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He had been to Jerusalem and he had done some work. He had, he had looked at them when he entered triumphantly. And then he went back to Bethany. On the morrow now, he came back. And as he was coming back, he was hungry. And he looked at a fig tree in verse 13. Seeing that fig tree, he thought he might get something out of that fig tree. But it says it was not yet the time of the fig to bear fruit. 
But Jesus said, because he found leaves on it without any fruit, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. We'll explain all that later. But we need to understand this, that the fig tree is an emblem, a symbol standing for the land of Israel, the children of Israel, the nation of Israel. As you look at the Old Testament and even the New Testament, you'll discover that the Lord has made the tree to represent a nation and to represent a man. To understand that the tree represents a man, every man, come to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And I'm reading here from verse, uh, reading from verse 15. It says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly there are many wolves. And ye shall know them by their fruits. You know, he has spoken about the prophet, about the false prophet, and instead of uh, still using the language of the prophet, he now brings in the fruit. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Is comparing the people with trees, the fig tree in particular. Look at verse 19. In verse 19 it says, Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And he's talking about the prophets. He's talking about the men. And he says, everyone, every man, and then every tree that brings not forth good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. After you said that, you said in verse 20, Wherefore, ye shall know them, wherefore, by their fruits, ye shall know them. You'll know the false prophets by their character. You'll know the trees by the fruit they bear. Look at chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, and we're reading from verse 33. Matthew chapter 12, reading from verse 33. What we're looking at is to understand that the tree represents a nation. The tree represents a man. The tree represents every individual. And when Jesus spoke about the tree, he's talking about the individual. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by its fruits. Look at verse 34, generation of vipers. How can ye be evil? Speak good things, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. It's talking about the tree bearing fruit, and then it comes to the reality, and it talks about the people. Let's come to Luke chapter 3. In Luke chapter 3, reading from verse 7. Luke chapter 3, reading from verse 7. Understand, the tree stands for the nation, and the tree stands for the man as well. In Luke chapter 3, reading from verse 7, it says, Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the rock to come. Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Understand, he's talking about the people, the sinners that came. He wanted them to show the fruit of repentance. And now look at verse 9. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. It's referring to the people. And he's saying that the trees, are, the people are represented by trees. And as the trees, pull the trees are cut down and they are cast into the fire, even so, the people who have not repented, if they die in that condition, there is a destiny for them. Verse 9, and now, also the ass is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree 
therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit, is cut down, is sewn down, and cast into the fire. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do? What shall we do then? How do we repent? How do we turn away from judgment? How do we avoid the judgment that is to come? So, as we come back to Mark chapter 11, we need to understand that Jesus was speaking about the nation of Israel. Jesus was talking about the leaders in Israel. Jesus was talking about every person that comes to live on this earth. Come back to Mark chapter 11 as we read from verse 12. Mark chapter 11 verse 12, and on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to eat, he found nothing but leaves, nothing but leaves, nothing, no fruit but leaves. But the time of figs was not yet. The people who know the agriculture of that land, that is of the land of Israel, they tell us that when a fig tree is growing up, before the leaves come, some preliminary fruit will come. And those fruits are edible. You can pick and eat. And so as the leaves were there, Jesus knew that there must have been fruit before the leaves will come up. But when he got there, he didn't see any fruit at all. And because he didn't see any fruit, he said, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. How could Jesus say that? How could Jesus condemn that tree? Because the purpose of the whole of creation is to please the Lord is to serve the Lord and is to make the Lord happy and joyful. And that tree was made to feed the Lord and to serve the Lord. Everything on earth belongs to the Lord. We've learned about divine ownership. The whole earth belongs to the Lord. All the trees belong to the Lord. All the animals belong to the Lord. All the people belong to the Lord. And so that tree did not fulfill the purpose for which the tree was created. And so Jesus said, you are to serve me. You are to please me. You are to feed me. And you are to give me whatever I need. That's the purpose of living. And since you are not fulfilling that purpose, then there's no chance for you to live again. No man eats fruit of thee hereafter forever. And then eventually when the disciples passed by again, they saw the fig tree was dried up from the roots. And Jesus taught them a great lesson on faith from that fruitless tree. The topic tonight is cultivating faith despite the fruitless fig tree. Cultivating faith despite the fruitless fig tree. Instead of the disciples missing the point and missing their lesson and missing the possibility of cultivating faith because some people might stumble at the cursing of the tree, at the drawing up of the tree, Jesus said, I did that to show you this, that you too can manifest faith. And if you will speak to the tree or to the mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea. And you will not doubt, you don't have to be looking as see it dried up, as see not dried up. When Jesus spoke the word and the tree began to dry up from the roots, they couldn't see the roots. They didn't know the roots were dried up. And the tree was like it was still normal. But the following day, everything dried up. That's what happens to your problem. From the roots, it dries up. And even if you don't see any manifestation at the time of saying the final amen, that root has dried up. And all those problems are gone. By the time you wake up the following morning, you say, lo and behold, it's gone. 
your problems tonight are gone. Cultivating faith despite the fruitless victory. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the condemnation of the fruitless victory. The condemnation of the fruitless victory. Point number two, the confidence of faith and fundamental truth. That's a fundamental truth. What Jesus said goes beyond time. What Jesus said goes beyond the nation of Israel. What Jesus said goes beyond the first century. Any time, every time that we mention the name of Jesus and pray to the Father, every tree you speak against, every mountain you speak again, that mountain must vanish away. The confidence of faith and fundamental truth. Point number three, our comprehension of fairly forgiving trespasses. Our understanding, our comprehension of fairly forgiving trespasses. So come to point number one, the condemnation of the fruitless fig tree. We're coming back to Mark chapter 11, and it's from verse 12. To verse 14, which we have read already. Let's now come to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, reading from verse 19, telling us about what happened to the fig tree. We're looking at Matthew chapter 21, verse 19. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon. Think about your life. I believe Jesus will find fruit in your life. The fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the meekness, the temperance, and the self-control, and the faith and the fidelity. That's the fruit he's looking for. He wants to find that fruit in your life. But he came to this fig tree, but he found only leaves, leaves only, and said to it, Let no man, let no fruit grow on thee, henceforth, forever. You see, if somebody dies without bearing the fruit of the Spirit, the joy, the peace, the love, the long-suffering, the self-control, the selflessness, unselfishness, the fruit of the Spirit, it shows that that life is empty of the Holy Ghost. It's empty of the goodness and the grace of God. And that person forever will be separated from the Lord. And it says, and presently, the fig tree withered away. Withered away. I pray your life will not wither away. Your Christian profession will not wither away. And your testimony will not wither away in Jesus' name. But God is looking for fruit. Not leaves only. Not leaves only. Profession only. Not leaves only. Uh, testimonies only. But then the character is not there. The conduct is not there. The fruit is not there. Look at Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5, and we're reading from verse 7. For you to understand that Jesus actually was looking at the nation of Israel. He was looking at the nation of Israel for these three years, or three and a half years, he had been ministering to them. And he had been showing them the way of grace, and the way of godliness, and the way to have the fruit of the Spirit in their lives. But lo and behold, only empty worship, Lo and behold, only tradition. Lo and behold, only religion. Lo, lo and behold, only profession of the faith. But the real fruit was not there. They had leaves only, but no fruit. And Jesus now was about to abandon them, was about to uh, place a judgment on them, condemnation for the fruitless fig tree. Isaiah chapter 5, we're reading from verse 7. Isaiah chapter 5, reading from verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. It's a vineyard of fig trees. And yet, the Lord says, the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And men, the men of Judah, 
are his pleasant plant, the men of Judah, the people of Judah, the children of Israel are his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, he looked for justice, he looked for righteousness, he looked for equity, he looked for good character, he looked for a character that will represent God and honor God, he looked for judgment, but behold oppression, and for righteousness, but behold a cry. That tells you then very clearly the Bible interprets itself that the children of Israel, they were represented by the fig tree. They were fruitless. They didn't bear any fruit. Come to Luke. Luke reading from chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, we're reading from verse 6, the fig tree, representing the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, and representing every individual we must bear fruit. If there is no fruit, then there is judgment. Look at this in Luke chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 6. And he speak also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. It's not coming home to the children of Israel. It's coming home to the people of Israel, the religious, traditional people of Israel. That the father, a certain man, planted a fig tree, and he sought fruit on it, but then he found none. Verse 7, Then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit, on this fig tree. You understand three years? That's the time of the ministry of Jesus Christ in the midst of the children of Israel. All these three years I've been preaching repentance. All these three years I've been preaching righteousness. All these three years I've been telling them repent and believe the gospel. All these three years I've stretched out my hand wanting them to come to the kingdom of God. All these three years I've been tending, I've been taking care of the fig tree and then I'm looking for fruit I find none cut it down why combat each the ground and he answering said unto him Lord let it alone this year also after three years some months are coming on out let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it and if it bear fruit well if after taking care for the next six months now to complete the three and a half years of ministry, if it bears fruit, if it turns around, if it repents, if it receives me as their Savior, the Christ, and the Redeemer, that will be all right. And if not, then after that, thou shalt call it down. That means the opportunity does not continue forever. After that, thou shalt cut it down. What happened then to the children of Israel? What happened to the fig tree that will not bear any fruit? What happened to the fig tree that refused to repent and refused to turn? Come to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 20. The Lord now was looking at the fig tree. He was looking at the people. He was looking at the result of his ministry in their lives and in the nation. Matthew chapter 11 verse 20. Then began he to abridge. He began to rebuke. He began to condemn the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done. Because they repented not, the fruit of repentance was not there. <clears throat> and because of that, look at verse 21, want, want to thee, Chorazin, want to thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. In, in ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And this was part of the land of Israel. 
the land was seen, if the mighty works were done in another country, in another place, even in Gentile nations, they would have repented long ago. But all these mighty works are done in you to confirm that this is the Christ, this is the Redeemer, and this is the one that has come to take our sins away. But you have not repented. You are coming to judgment, and you will be, you will be in that judgment. It will be more terrible than the judgment of the pagans of the heathen. Look at verse 23. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted in, unto heaven, that shall be brought down to hell. It is the condemnation of the fig tree that will not bear fruit. It is the condemnation of the cities that will not produce the fruit of repentance. It says they were exalted to heaven by the miracles that happened to them. And by the blind eyes that saw, by the lame that walked, and by the great things the Messiah did to confirm this is the Christ. And yet they did not repent. It says they'll be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it will have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. We're coming to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, and we're reading from verse 34, from verse 37. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. There are people that say that, you know, those who are saved, God compelled them to be saved. God had ordained they will be saved. God had written from eternity that they will be saved. And they say those who are not saved, God doesn't want to save them. God doesn't want, God created them for hellfire. Nothing like that at all. Jesus cried over Jerusalem. He said, you are the fig tree and I've been taking care of you. I dig around you. I put a fertilizer, my no around you, expecting you will bear fruit. I would have gathered you and shielded you and protected you and given you salvation and given you uh, forgiveness that will protect you from death eternal, suffering eternal, and that will protect you from punishment, eternal punishment. But ye would not. It's not God that denied them of salvation. They denied themselves. Ye would not. Verse 39, for I say unto you, Ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We're coming to Luke chapter 19. The same thing you are going to find here. As for salvation, Christ made salvation available for them. As for repentance, he told them about repentance. As for fruit bearing, he made it possible in every way that they will bear fruit. But they were not open to the word and they were not willing to bear fruit. Look at Luke chapter 19. Reading from verse 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. He beheld the city and wept over it. Wait a minute. If Jesus knew that his father created all these generations of Jewish people to perish, and he knew that God did not want them to repent, why will he be weeping for the will of the Father? No, the Father wanted them to repent, and Jesus wanted them to repent, and heaven was made for them as heaven is made for every one of us, but they were the people that sealed their hearts. They were the people that made their hearts hard as a stone, as adamant. That's the reason why they were not saved. And it says in that verse 41, and when he was come near, 
he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou art known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes, for the days, for the days shall come upon thee. There's the cursing of the fig tree now, fruitless. There's the condemnation of the fig tree now that, is, uh, that, that doesn't have any fruit. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and uh, shall lay thee even with, with the ground. That is will level them, will destroy them, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. You have abandoned your chance, you have neglected your chance because of that. That's why the judgment is going to come upon them. We're looking at John chapter 15. John chapter 15, reading from verse 6. If a man abide not in me, if a man, he has heard the word of God, he says he has repented, he ought to bring forth the fruit of righteousness, and yet he does not abide in Christ to remain righteous, to remain holy to remain saved and to remain connected to Christ the Savior. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. He's talking about a man and now he likens him to the branch of a tree and is withered and men gathered them and cast them into the fire and they are burnt. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, the final age of those who do not bring forth the fruit, the fruit of righteousness and the fruit of repentance and the fruit of the Spirit. Hebrews chapter 6, reading here from verse 7. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 7. It says, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh out upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. That's the fruit bearing tree, the one, the Christian, the one, the believer who has come to Christ and is bearing fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, that the love of God and the love for every man. There is the joy of salvation. There is peace in the earth and peace with his fellow man. There is long suffering without complaint. There is long suffering without murmuring. There is meekness, there is loneliness, there is humility. There is faithfulness, there is fidelity in handling matters. Matters in the office and matters everywhere. He is faithful to the Lord and is persevering. He is patient and he perseveres unto the end. That person will be blessed. But look at verse 8. But that which beareth sons and briars is rejected. It's not bearing the fruit of the Spirit. It's not bearing the fruit of Christ-like character. It's not bearing the fruit of life eternal. It's not bearing the fruit of grace and goodness and godliness. But that which beareth sons and briars is rejected and near unto cursing whose end is to be burnt. I pray that our end will not end in hellfire. We will not be burnt in hellfire. The word of God will produce fruit in our lives in Jesus' name. And the fruit will be evident to God. The fruit will be visible even to our neighbors. Our lives will reflect the fruit and the power and the grace of what we are learning. It will be so in Jesus' name. Let's come back to Mark chapter 11. We're coming to point number two now. Mark chapter 11. We have read verses 12 to 14. And the following day, they now saw. 
what really happened. Look at verse 20 now. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the, from the roots. They saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. You know what happened? When Jesus spoke, those disciples heard. And they looked at the fig tree, and the fig tree was still as green as ever, as if nothing had happened. Because the root was under the ground in the soil, and they couldn't see the root, they didn't know that anything had happened. Anytime Jesus speaks against the fig tree that is not bearing fruit in your life, something must happen. Anytime Jesus speaks against any perplexity in your life and say, why is this here? I don't understand. And it's not bearing fruit. And Jesus speaks against that thing. It must dry up. Go to sleep. The following day, you'll see the result of the prayer. I said the following day, you'll see the result of the prayer. The confidence of faith and fundamental truth and look at verse 21 and peter calling to remembrance says unto him master behold the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away the fig tree is withered away peter was surprised jesus was not surprised jesus knew that whatever word he speaks must be fulfilled. Any word he speaks into your life must be fulfilled. Will be fulfilled. And every day of your life, just let him speak or take his word and speak that to your own situation. Something good must happen. And so Jesus now had to teach them concerning faith, the confidence of faith, and the fundamental truth. Look at verse 22. Jesus answering says unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever, he said this, not just me, Peter, you can do it and you will do it. John, you can do it and you will, and you will do it. And what's your name? I said, what's your name? You can do it and you'll do it in Jesus' name. <clears throat> For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, like I spoke to the fruitless fig tree, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe, Jesus was saying, when I spoke to that fig tree, I didn't look at the appearance. I didn't doubt in my heart. I knew every word I speak must be fulfilled. If you will be like that, when you speak to the mountain and you do not doubt in your heart and you will believe that those things which you have said will come to pass, you will have whatsoever you say. Therefore, verse 24, I say unto you that what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them. Tell me. And, and what? You will have them in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 21. The same truth is emphasized there. The same principle is emphasized here. Matthew chapter 21. I'm reading from verse 20, 21, verse 20. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, certainly, and truly, without any shadow of doubt, I say unto you, If ye have faith, thank God I have faith. I say, thank God I have faith. We had faith, the faith to get saved, that's how we got saved, by faith. And the faith to get sanctified, that's how we got sanctified, because of faith. And when you enter into maybe a taxi or your own car or, you know, another person's car to bring you here to the Bible study, you had faith, you are not checking up. 
will he take me there? Will he not take me there? You didn't ask the driver, uh, can I check up your driving license? Is it a uh, current? And are you sure that this uh, vehicle is up to standard and will take me there? That's faith. You just relax. You enter into the aeroplane and you relax. And the pilot makes all the announcements and he said, this way you are going. You did anything did not cross your mind. We might land in another destination. You believe what they said. When you go to sleep, you believe that tomorrow morning will come and the morning comes. And when you go to work, you believe it will soon be closing time. And true, it's the closing time. We have faith. Transfer that faith to when you speak against a mountain, that mountain will move away. It says, if ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also ye shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed. Somebody help me shall be thou removed. It will go. And be thou cast into the sea, and it shall be done. Look at verse 22 now. All things. How many things? I said how many things? All things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believe in, ye shall receive. Did somebody say amen in that corner? Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. We're reading from verse 23. Mark chapter 9. And we're reading from verse 23. Jesus says unto him, If thou canst believe, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. As you believe tonight, all things are possible. Your life will not, uh, will not uh, end in shambles in Jesus' name. What you desire, a good life, a righteous life, a victorious life, a healthy life, it must be. It must come to pass. Jesus says unto him, if thou canst believe, how many things? All things are possible to him that believeth. All things are possible in my life. Happiness possible. Joy possible. Victory possible. And progress possible. And going higher and higher possible. In your life, in my life, in your family, in my family, in our lives, in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. When Christ says it once, it's true. When he says it twice, it's doubly true. And when he says it more than two times, it is certain it must happen in our lives in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 17, verse 19. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. Jesus had gone to the Mount of Transfiguration, and he went with Peter, James, and John. And this man brought uh, the, the son that was uh, demonized, that had epilepsy. And when the, the child was brought to them for prayer, the very first thought in their mind is, Oh, Jesus is not around. But he had given them authority. He had given them power. And he had told them they could speak to the mountain. But what we were thinking about is the absence of Jesus. If Jesus were here, this is only what Jesus can do. They transferred everything to Jesus. They didn't know. They didn't remember that every one of them could speak to that mountain. And that mountain will move away. You can speak to your mountain and that mountain will move away. You don't have to be thinking Jesus is far away. No, he's not far away. He said, I'm with you. Always, even to the end of the world. And the Spirit of God abides in you and dwells in you. And he has said, the work I do, ye shall do. And greater works than this shall ye do, because I go to the Father. The arch of unbelief. And Jesus said, if ye have faith, 
as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, you will not cry before the mountain. You will not complain before the mountain. You will not murmur before your mountain. You will not be wondering why, why this now? Why am I going through this now? Mountain, why are you there? Oh God, what have I done? That's not prayer. That's not prayer. Change your language. No more murmuring. No more complaining. No more crying. I told you before, don't let the devil see tears on your face. I will not weep because of Satan. I will not weep because of any mountain. Jesus said, don't cry, don't cry. Tell that mountain, remove hands to yonder place, and it shall remove. Somebody say, good amen. amen. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. When it says mountain, what's he talking about? Number one, the mountain of sin. Habitual sin, perpetual sin, and besetting sin. It's like a mountain. You want to cross over to victory, but that mountain will not allow you. Today, you will conquer that mountain of sin. The mountain of sickness. There's a sickness there. It's the time you want to go for exam. That's when sickness will come. It's the time you want to go and do something good. The time, the highest time in your life. Happy time in your life. And you say, praise the Lord. It's going to be a new beginning. Praise the Lord. It's year 2020. And I see that in front of me. And I'm going to get it. I'm going to be a go-getter. And it's at that time a mountain of sickness will come to tell you that what are you planning what do you think you'll become mountain will not allow you you'll not cry you'll say mountain you're a liar i am going up and i'm going to get there that mountain of sickness you speak to it it will vanish away in jesus name we're talking about the mountain of suffering. It may be in your family. It may be in your place of work. It may be in your community. It's like they recall the suffering in that community, all the suffering of the villages, and they pile everything upon you. And you're weighed down. And you're saying, what am I going to do now? I thought I'm going to climb every mountain. I'm, I thought I'm going to soar. I thought this would be a new year for me. I have but all those saying that the pastor said that this will be the best year of my life. Look at me now. This year, 2020, so, uh, suffering will not allow me. Suffering will vanish away. You will speak to that mountain of suffering. Come out. It will go out in Jesus' name. There are people that have mountains of stumbling blocks, stumbling blocks. You know, they're walking and they're happy and they're joyful and they're moving on happily, excitedly. All of a sudden, there's a stumbling block. And if they don't fall there, they stand. They stand still. What can I do now? This is always coming. And if you're a person who keeps record, you're saying, I remember this time the other year, exactly this scene happened. Exactly this scene happened. And then you stand there and you're wondering, stumbling blocks, that stumbling block, somebody has to remove that thing. I said somebody has to remove that thing. And you must show whoever puts the stumbling block there, the one inside you is greater than that stumbling block. And that mountain of stumbling block, you say, go, it will go in Jesus' name. Sometimes it's a mountain of satanic spirits. Satanic spirits is walking up and down there, is bringing darkness, is bringing confusion. The brain is turning. I don't have appetite. I don't know what I'm going to do now. I see them here. I see them there. And I pack out from where I was living. I pack to another place. The same problem. The scene is still coming. I live there. I go to another place. How, how long are we going to be running away from the devil? The devil will still follow if he wants to follow that satanic spirit. You stop where you are. You turn around and face that mountain of satanic spirit and say, I speak to you the word of authority. 
you will not follow me again. You will not come after me again. And I command you, go, it will go in Jesus' name. Sometimes it's the mountain of strange seduction. Strange seduction. Uh, you're just living your life. Praise the Lord, I'm saved. Praise the Lord, I'm sanctified. I've been hearing about sanctification. I've been hearing of holiness. And now I know sanctification. Holiness is possible. Thank you, Jesus. You have sanctified me. Thank you, Lord. You have made me holy. All of a sudden, seduction. Strange seduction. And it strikes your mind. I'll say what? The average person will say, I thought I was sanctified. I thought I was holy. They accept the seduction of the devil and they make it personal. They accept, I will never accept. I said I will never accept. Any registered letter that comes from Satan, and they bring you to your house and they say, what's your name? You mention your name and you say, there's a letter here for you. And you must sign. You say, from where is that? And you say, from Mr. Satan. Lock your door. Say, go away. I don't have any covenant with Satan. I don't have any agreement with Satan. I'm not expecting any parcel from him. Are you expecting parcel from Satan? That thing must go. The mountain of strange seduction will vanish away in Jesus' name. The mountain of stormy situation. Everything just becomes like a storm. You enter the house, a storm. You go to the office, a storm. You go to the market, a storm. You say, what's all this? And Jesus has told me, let us pass on to the other side. Brother, I see you. You are going to pass to the other side. Sister, there, I see you. You are going to pass to the other side. And while you are endeavoring to pass to the other side, look at the stormy situation. Don't say, I thought, or I'm going to the other side. Don't think, recall, recollect the words of Jesus Christ as a mountain. Speak to that mountain of stormy situation. It will vanish away in Jesus' name. I said it will vanish away in Jesus' name. Look at this now. Matthew chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 18. Matthew chapter 18. And we're reading from verse 18. The word of authority is now in your mouth. The word of power is now in your mouth. See how that fig tree dried up when Jesus said, No man eat fruit of you anymore forever. It didn't appear anything that happened. And when you speak that word, you may not have any feeling. And you may not have any sight and any sign that anything has happened. Don't take back your word. You have released the word of power. That word must take effect. Matthew chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 18. Matthew 18, reading from verse 18. It tells us in verse 18, Verily, certainly, assuredly, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Are you there? Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound where? Don't wait for somebody to bind it for you. You will bind it yourself. Don't wait for somebody to cast it out for you. You'll cast it out yourself. Don't wait for somebody to speak the word on your behalf. You will speak the word and it will be done in Jesus' name. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall lose on earth he shall release on earth, shall be loose in heaven, shall be released from heaven in Jesus' name. I'm waiting for blessing. And I hope I'll get the blessing. I'm waiting for blessing. I hope somebody, they will not tie down my blessing. They will not hold down my blessing. Have you forgotten the word? We just read it. Whatever you lose on earth is loose in heaven. 
if you release blessing upon your life, you'll be blessed in Jesus' name. I am blessed. I'm blessed going out. I'm blessed coming in. I'm blessed coming to church. I'm blessed going home. I'm blessed coming to, coming to my place of work. I'm blessed going to the village. I'm blessed going to the town. I release blessing upon myself. I am blessed in Jesus' name. You are blessed. I said you are blessed. Look at that verse 18 again. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever, whatsoever, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. Somebody shout Amen. amen. Acts chapter 27, Acts chapter 27. We're reading from verse 25. Acts chapter 27. We're reading from verse 25. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be as it was told me. Brother, be of good cheer. Sister, be of good cheer. I believe God it shall be even as the Lord has told us tonight in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapter 4, I'm reading here from verse, uh, reading from verse uh, 16, Romans chapter 4. I will read him from verse 16. Your blessing has come. Your spiritual breakthrough has come. Uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickness the dead, even God who quickness the dead, and call it those things would be not as though they were. Call it those things would be not as though they were. When you have not seen the blessing in the physical, in the natural, you say, I got it. I said, I got it. I prayed, I told the Lord, I believe he has answered my prayer. I believe he has given it to me because he called it those things would be not as though they were who against hope, believed in hope. And that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And be not weak in faith, he considered not his somebody body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strong in faith. Somebody there, he was, and somebody there, I am, say it aloud. He was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded. When you speak to that mountain, you must be fully persuaded. When you speak to that problem, you must be fully persuaded, fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. What he has promised, he was able also to perform. He will perform that in your life. He will accomplish it in your life. Faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And as you have heard, the Lord will accomplish it. We're looking at Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. I'm reading here from verse 5. Luke chapter 17 verse 5. And the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. And they had been thinking all along, if we can have a mountain of faith, we'll be able to get rid of a mountain of problems. And so they said, increase our faith. But look at what Jesus said in verse 6. And the Lord said, if he had faith as a grain of mustard seed, the smallest size of faith and the smallest nature of faith, 
if it's the real faith, faith in God, who created the whole of the universe, faith in the word of God, the word of God that cannot be contradicted. If you want faith as a, a seed of, as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this psycho psychometry, be thou plucked up by the root and be planted in the sea. It shall and it shall obey you. And it shall obey me. And it shall obey me. Say it for yourself. It will obey you. It will be done in Jesus' name. Second Corinthians, I'm reading from chapter 4, and we're looking at verse 13. Second Corinthians chapter 4, we're reading from verse 13. Reading from verse 13. We having the same spirit of faith. Look at that. We believers, we children of God, having the same spirit of faith according as it is written. I believed. I believe, I believe, therefore have I spoken. He said, I believe if I speak to the mountain, the mountain will move away. I believe the words of Jesus. I believe that heaven and earth may pass away. But the words of Jesus will not pass away. And because I believe that, therefore have I spoken. We also believe, therefore will speak. We also believe, therefore, therefore, you speak, you speak in Jesus' name. By faith, what do you do? You move your mountain. By faith, you move your mountain. What do we do by faith? By faith, we manifest his might. He said, the same power I have, the same might I have, the same possibility I have, you can do that too. I spoke to the fig tree, and from the root it dried up. You can do that too. By faith, you can manifest his might. By faith, you can magnify his majesty. He lives in you, and you live for him. And the life I now live in the Lord, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who died for me because he loved me. And because of that, by faith, I magnify his majesty. By faith, I minimize the mixed multitude. You know, the mixed multitude saying, ah, that's the problem you have. Ah, I'm sorry for you. The somebody had that kind of problem, look at what happened. Then as you go out, I look at your face and I see that there's, there's a problem. Do you know the name of this sickness? Do you know the name of this uh, problem? Mixed multitude, mixed multitude. They tell you here, they tell you there. By faith, you minimize the mixed multitude. You know, on your, on your, on your tablet, on your you know, desktop, when you minimize something, you just click that button, it goes out of your sight. Everything the mixed multitude may be saying about this, about this, about that, click the button of faith and everything will vanish away in Jesus' name. By faith, you major on his marvels. You major and you meditate on his marvels. Look at what Christ has done. And look at what Christ is doing now. And look at what Christ will continue to do in your life, on your body, in your family, on your children, on your wife, on your husband. You have the final say. I said you have the final say. If something is happening to any member of the family, you don't, uh, you know, give up and then begin to cry. This is the way it happened to, I had the story. This is the way it happened to so and so. I had the story. That's the way it happened to so and so. You have nothing to do with so and so. All you have is the word of faith and the word of power. Look at the mountain before you on a member of your family. You say, I will not have this. I will not allow this to go like that. You mountain on a member of my family, I command you, come out. It has to come out. I said it has to come out. 
Satan does not have the final say in your life. Say that for yourself. Satan does not have the final say in your family. Say that for yourself. Satan does not have the final say in your business. Say that for yourself. The final word is in your mouth. The final decision is in your mouth. Speak to that mountain. That mountain has to move away. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 16. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able, you'll be able. Even tonight, you are able. I said tonight, you are able. By prayer, you are able. By faith, you are able. With the calling of God upon your life, you are able in Jesus' name. Above all, taking the shield of faith, where we shall be able to quench, quench, quench. Tell me, tell me, tell me. Say it aloud. Praise the Lord, you are free. There is no barrier that can hinder you. There is no yoke that can hinder you. There is no mountain that can hinder you. There is no oppression that can abide forever upon you. There is no sickness that can be permanent in your life. There is no defeat. There is no failure that will be permanent in your life. Above all, taking the shield of faith, when which ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. All the fiery darts of the wicked. Thank God I overcome. I say, thank God, I overcome. Uh, you know, that's how to be saying it every time. I overcome, I overcome. Wake up in the morning, I'm an overcomer. And then you're going on the road, I'm an overcomer. You know, sometimes your heart will look like it's not hearing. You know, the, the heart, you've not been speaking to yourself, your heart like that before. It's like when you call a child and you call the name, the child be, you know, be looking at this direction. I will not answer you. You call the name again. You're not allowed the child to rest. And the child may turn a little bit. You call the child again until the child will wake up. Your heart will wake up. Your mind will wake up. And you tell your mind, I am an overcomer. You'll be an overcomer in Jesus' name. A victor. A victoria. Confirmed in Jesus' name. Brother Victor, where is he? Sister Victoria, where are you? Victory in your life in Jesus' name. We're coming back now to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. And I'm coming to point number three now. Our comprehension of fairly forgiving trespasses. Very important, very important. We're coming to Mark chapter 11 and we're reading from verse 25 and when you stand praying forgive if ye have ought against any forgive if ye have ought against any that your father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses but look at this but listen very well but take note of this if you do not forgive neither will your father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses the lord is telling us here the condition of our heart and our relationship with people forgiving those who have offended us that's very important as we stand praying and you recollect and you remember so and so has offended me the lord said forgive and then another, you remember another person has offended me, forgive. Your husband, forgive. Your wife, forgive. Your children, forgive. Your parents, forgive. Your co-workers, forgive. Your neighbors, forgive. Your friends, forgive. Even your persecutors, forgive. If you want your prayers to be answered. But you know, many people don't understand this area of forgiveness. He's talking about personal Offense, personal offense. If somebody has offended you personally, don't take that to heart. Don't be a grudge. Forgive and go your way. And then the word of authority will still remain in your mouth. 
but understand there are sins that are committed there are trespasses that are committed you can't take ownership of that you can't say i forgive think about abimelech and abraham abimelech took the wife of abraham and god himself said abimelech you are a dead man you must restore the wife of Abraham unto him. He is a prophet. What do I learn from that? Abimelech offended God. And Abraham cannot say, Abimelech, don't worry, I forgive you. No, you cannot. Because God said, it's a dead man. That if he does not restore that wife, it's a dead man. Abraham cannot say, Abimelech, don't worry. I can let go. I don't mind. After all, she's my wife. And you've taken the wife. You can go. I forgive you. That's not a sin you can forgive. That one is in the hand of God. Look at Moses and Pharaoh. Pharaoh eh, did not allow the children of Israel to go. That's not a sin against Moses. It's a sin against God. And Moses cannot say, Pharaoh, that's all right. You don't want them to go. They're serving you. And they're doing this and that for you. Okay, I am Moses. I forgive you. No, Moses, you cannot, because that's not a sin against Moses. It's a sin against God. Achan had taken their corset sin. And when Achan took their corset sin, because of that, 36 of the children of Israel died. And God said, Joshua, I'm not going to be with you until you take that corset sin away. Joshua cannot say Achan. So you are the one that took that sin. What shall we do now? I love you. I pity you. I forgive you. Joshua, you cannot. That's not a sin against Joshua. It's a sin against God and against the nation. A policeman cannot see a criminal on the street and he's seeing him like this, committing the crime, and he goes to that criminal. You know what? As a policeman, I should arrest you. But I'm a Christian. And we're going to the Bible study. And in the Bible study, we're told, when you stand praying, I forgive. I forgive you. No, sir. Policeman, he didn't offend you. He's offended the nation. He's committed crime against the nation. You cannot go there. As Joshua cannot say, I forgive Achan. That's not a sin against you. Look at Samuel and Saul. God said, Samuel, why are you crying for Saul? I have rejected him because he has rejected my word. And then Saul, Samuel came to Saul and said, what have you done? And then they discussed, and uh, Saul might say, in fact, he said, I have sinned. Forgive me. Samuel cannot forgive. It wasn't a sin against Samuel. That's a sin against God. When people sin against God, let them sexual with God. If people are doing evil and they're destroying other people, destroying their property and killing them and all that, you cannot just go there and say, I forgive you, I forgive you. You cannot go to the prison and say, why are you here? Why are you here? Why are you here? Okay, I forgive you, I forgive you. We have prison ministry and all of you here, I have the authority, I forgive you. They didn't sin against you. It wasn't any personal sin. Elijah could not tell Ahab, Ahab, I see what you've been doing. And your wife Jezebel had been the one motivating you and, and driving you. All right, Ahab, I just have a good intention and good move towards you. I forgive you, Elijah, you cannot. Ahab did not sin against you. He sinned against the Lord. Nathan, you're coming to David. And you have been the prophet of David for a long time. Look at what David has done. And Nathan would say, all right, David, I forgive you. No, Nathan, you cannot do that. He didn't sin against you. He sinned against the Lord. Come to the New Testament, John and Judas. Look at what Judas had done. And then for John to say, I'm the beloved apostle. I have a tender nature. I have a good nature. And I have a loving nature. Judas, I forgive you. You cannot do that, John. Jesus had said, Judas, that's thing you are going to do. 
if you do it, it were better you were not born. John the Baptist could not tell Herod, you've taken your brother's wife. Okay, it's against the word of God, but just to forget about everything. Herod, I forgive you. John the Baptist, you cannot do that. Or Peter with Ananias and Sapphira. That, uh, you know, you have not lied unto man. You have lied unto God. Peter cannot say, Ananias, I know what you've done. You've not sinned against me. You've sinned against the Holy Ghost. I forgive you. No, you cannot. Peter cannot do that. Or the Simon of Samaria that said, give me this gift and then I'll give you money. Peter cannot say, how could you say that, Simon? And we have the same name. And we're bearing the same name. Don't do that again. I forgive you. No, you cannot forgive like that. It is sin against you. It's sinned against the Lord. Look at Paul and bad Jesus. Who was resisting the deputy to uh, attend to the faith. And Paul the apostle said, Thou child of the devil, and thou enemy of righteousness. Paul, are you not a believer? Why don't you forgive him? Even though he was hindering the deputy from accepting the word of God, he didn't sin against me. It's against God. That's what we learn from the word of God. If it's a personal offense, you forgive. If it's a personal sin, you forgive. But if it is sin against God, and sin against righteousness, and sin against the word of God, and sin against the people of God, you cannot say, okay, I forgive, I forgive, I forgive. Whatever anybody has done, let the backslider, let him keep on doing the work of God. Let the backslider, let him keep on a year in ministry. I forgive, I forgive. No, they have not sinned against you. It's only the sin that is against you, you can forgive. Look at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 21, Matthew chapter 18, reading from verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft will my brother sin against me, against me, not against you, that's in your hand, not against God, that's in God's hand, not against the truth, that's in the area of the people who are supposed to protect and defend the truth. How often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times. And Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until somebody there tell me. Seventy times seven. As people offend us, and it's a personal of offense, we'll forgive in Jesus' name. I said, well, forgive in Jesus' name. If they sin against God, tell them to go back to God. And only God has the right. Only God has the authority. Only God has given them the promise. He will forgive them if they repent. You won't know if they repent, but God will know when they have repented. In Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, we're reading from verse 31. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another and tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. That spirit of forgiveness, the Lord will grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. In Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 2 rather, Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, we're reading from verse 12. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, by words of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgive you, so do ye. That grace to forgive. 
the Lord will give unto us. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're reading from verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 16. Look at this. In verse 16, at my first answer, no man stood by me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. I forgive them. They disappointed me. I forgive them. And they shattered my hope. I forgive them. No man stood with me. I helped them. I preached to them. I counseled them. I cared for them. And now I'm facing persecution. And all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. That's personal offense. Personal offense. He forgave. Look at verse 14 now. Verse 14. Alexander, the copper smith, did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Paul, what are you doing? Alexander the coppersmith has done much evil. As you forgive the other people in verse 16, why don't you forgive him too? Look at verse 15. Of whom be thou where also, for he has greatly withstood our words. He greatly withstood the truth. He greatly opposed the gospel. And because of that, he hindered other people from getting saved, from receiving the word. That's a sin against God and against the great commission and against the word of truth. The Lord require it of him. Let him go and search over God. That's not in my hand. But the people that have offended me personally, that's in my hand. I forgive them. I pray God will give us understanding. I say God will give us understanding. God give you in particular understanding in Jesus' name. Let's come back now to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11 from verse 22. Jesus answering says unto them, unto you, have faith in God. Do you have faith in God? I say, do you have faith in God? For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have, I will have, you will have, we shall have, the church will have whatsoever will say it will come to pass. Therefore, I say unto you, therefore, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe. Who is believing there tonight? Believe. I said who is believing there tonight? Believe that ye have received, and ye shall have them. And ye shall have them. And ye shall have them your mountain will move. Your problems will vanish away. Your weakness will go away. The Lord will make you strong in Jesus' name. Where are you? Rise up and get rid of that fruitless fig tree. Rise up and get rid of that mountain occupying the land. Rise up and get rid of those mountains of problems and mountains of sin and mountains of sicknesses and mountains of suffering, and mountains of stumbling block, and mountains of satanic attack, or satanic suffering, or satanic spirit. Get rid of that a stormy situation in your life. Open your mouth and speak against every mountain of weakness. Everything has to vanish away tonight. It will happen in Jesus' name. Tell the Lord. Tell the Lord. That fig tree cannot just be standing there, taking all the space, taking all your attention, 
taking all your precious time and taking all your money every time that problem comes up we're back to that place again back to that place again and the money is going through into the bag with holes it turns to stop tonight let your fig tree bear fruit let your personal life bear fruit the fruitless tree will be cast into the fire. I'll bear fruit. Fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of love. Fruit of joy. Fruit of long suffering. Fruit of peace. Fruit of lowliness, meekness, fruit of humility, fruit of self denial. I'll bear fruit. I will bear fruit. Don't be a fruitless tree. Because the verdict of heaven is to cut down every tree that does not bear fruit. Whatever is stopping you from bearing fruit, report it to the Lord. You have the final say. Whatever hinders fruit bearing in your life, spiritual fruit in your life happiness in your life whatever hinders joy in your life report it to god it must go your wife will be approached your husband will be a fruit. Your family will be a fruit. The work of your hands will be a fruit. Your profession will be a fruit. Your Christian profession, your Christian life, you must be a fruit. Whatever hinders fruit bearing in every area, every direction of your life, you have the final say, it must leave. Nothing stops you. The word of authority is in your mouth. Nothing can stop you from moving on, from climbing up from achievement, from progress. You have the final say. No man can hinder you. No woman can hinder you. No power can hinder you. No occult can hinder you. No darkness can hinder you. No mountain can hinder you. No stumbling block can hinder you. No forceful person can hinder you. No adamant stone can hinder you. Nothing in the world, nothing on the land, nothing from the sea, nothing from the sky, no mountain, no hill, no tree, no forest, nothing can hinder you. The final word is in your mouth. No tradition can hinder you. No family background can hinder you. Nothing in your genetics can hinder you. Nothing from your forefathers can hinder you. No curse, no yoke, no territorial spirit, nothing can hinder you. You have the final word 
Your salvation, nobody can hinder that. Your sanctification, nobody can hinder that. Your power in the Holy Ghost, nobody can hinder that. Your joy, your happiness, your victory in the kingdom of God, nobody can hinder that. The word is in your mouth. The power is right there. You have authority you have not been using. You have the power you have not been using. Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you release on earth and whatsoever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Your life is connected with heaven. Your word of authority is connected with heaven. Your power is connected with heaven. Your assurance is connected with heaven. There's no bad luck for a child of God. Don't accept that. There's no bad luck. It's my luck. It's my problem. It's our family. It's the scene of my grandfather. It's the scene of my grandmother. Nothing like that for a child of God. It's because, for the, because of the idolatry in our extended family come out of that you have the final say your problems are solved your yoke is broken your mountain is removed this is your chance speak to that mountain this is your chance Move that mountain. Move that mountain. Manifest His majesty. He lives in you. He lives in you. Greater you see that is in me than he that is in the world. He lives in you. I believe, therefore have I spoken. Believe, speak out. Don't accept, don't accept any puzzle from Satan. Don't accept any registered letter from Satan. Don't accept any curse from anyone, any hindrance from anyone. Be on top of the problem. On top of the challenge, on top of the situation, speak the word. Speak the word. Your victory is in your hand. Speak it out. Your healing is in your mouth. Declare it. Your deliverance is coming out of your mouth. Declare that. Joy. Don't wait for another person to give you joy. It's in your mouth. Declare it. Have the joy of the Lord. Have the strength of the Lord. Have the power of the Lord. Have the anointing of the Spirit. What I say, I receive. What I say, I possess. What I say is mine. If he shall say, if he shall say, if he shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea.
and shall not doubt it in your heart, but shall believe that those things which you have said will come to pass, you will have what you say. I have it. I may conquer. I have it. I may victor. I have it. I may overcome. I have it. I am righteous. I have it. I am healed and healthy. I have it. I am strong. I have it. I will not allow any other power to rule my life. I have it. Believe what you say and say what you believe. Let nothing of Satan remain in your life. Don't give Satan authority in your life. Don't give the enemy authority in your life. Don't give a mountain authority in your life. Don't give problem authority in your life. Don't say, that's how the world is. That's how the children are. That's how wives are nowadays. That's how husbands are nowadays. That's my luck. That's my destiny. That's my fate. What can I do? Do something. Challenge that thing. You must be a happy Christian. A righteous Christian. A bold Christian. A conquering Christian. A progressing Christian. You have authority. You have confidence. You have power. You have the word of faith in your mouth. You will quench all the darts, the fairy darts of the wicked one. Let nothing stop your progress. Don't be timid before Satan. Don't be timid before a mountain. Don't be fearful before a problem. Open your mouth and speak. It will be done. Chair of brother, chair of sister, I believe God. It shall be, even as it was told me. It shall be, it must be. It shall be, it must be, it shall be, even as it was told me. You have it, victory. You have it, authority. You have it, salvation. You have it, holiness. You have it, power. You have it, anointing. You have it, final say. No other person can say another thing behind you. I don't know what they are saying. I don't know what the conspirators are saying. Don't worry about that. No matter what others say, it is what you say about your mountain that will take effect. Anything that is said behind you, Holds no water. Anything that is planned behind you holds no water. It is what you say that carries the day. It is what you say that carries the anointing. It is what you say that becomes final. Say it. Mountain cannot remain. Say it. 
The sin cannot remain sage. The weakness cannot remain sage. Problems cannot abide sage. Demonic power cannot oppress you sage. And it will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. I want you to say, In Jesus' name I pray. Say that again. With authority and assurance. It is done. I said it is done. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you because you have given us the final word. The final word of authority on every brother, on every sister, on every boy, on every girl. I pray you confirm their word in Jesus' name. Every fruitless tree in your life. Dry up in Jesus' name. Fruitless tree taking away your money, taking away your time, taking away your ability, taking away your joy, taking away your victory. Lord, I pray, dry it up in Jesus' name. Mountain before everyone. The mountain you've been afraid of before, the mountain you've been trembling before, the mountain that is almost crushing your life, the mountain that is not allowing you to enjoy victory in your Christian life. Mountain, I command you, move out in Jesus' name. In your family, mountains move out. In your profession, mountains move out. In your Christian life, mountains move out. Lord, I pray everything that has hindered your people until this time, whether their spirits, whether their, their background, whether it is in their genetics, whatever it is, Lord, I cancel every negative thing in their lives in Jesus' name. Your mountain is gone. Your problems are solved. Your sins are forgiven. Your heart is renewed. Your life will be better in Jesus' name. Victory for everyone. Success for everyone. Dominion for everyone. You're now going to be more than a conqueror in every area of your life in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because I know it's done. I know it's done. I know it's done. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise the Lord. I said praise the Lord. I said praise the Lord. Your mountain is gone.